Well, welcome everyone. It is uh, it's March now. Uh, two months have already gone by, and this year going by quickly. And we are here at our uh, uh, seventh uh, event in uh, in our series for the endurance campaign for a better business. <clears throat> so glad to have you on board with us, and appreciate your continuing to stay with us. Uh, we got a lot of people coming in, so uh, welcome everyone. And I'll leave you. Uh, Mike's on right now, and we might chat for a minute before I, I mute him. But this is our seventh series and the official end of the first part of our series, uh, which is the seven core topics that we've discussed. Uh, and number six and seven are required, so <clears throat> you're definitely uh, at the right place at the right time tonight. So thank you so much for being with us. I'm Steve Carver. All of you have uh, been on the program before, so I'm glad to have you on my journey, and thank you for letting me be on yours. I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, just offering free advice, and the best place to get free advice is at your small business centers uh, because they're, it's going to be confidential and no charge, and you'll be dealing with people that know what they're doing. Tonight we're being sponsored by the Small Business Center in Sampson County at Sampson Community College, and that would be Bart Rice, who is our our uh, our boss man does a good job helping us, and we'll look forward to setting up an appointment with you, or I'll help you do that. So thank you, Bart, for supporting the program as much as you have, and for many years now, and for the extra help you give to our uh, entrepreneurs that are getting started. Remember, if you have any questions or want me to do something special for you, type it in chat, and I'll see it there, and then try to follow up on it t uh, late tonight or tomorrow. Uh, with email as such as that. So uh, again, a special night for certificates and achievement of completion tonight. Uh, uh, as you send those in after tonight, you'll be able to qualify for uh, the certificate of achievement from the uh, community college, small business center. And if you have completed your homework and test uh, starting tonight, you can also uh, receive your graduation certificate uh, and title with the uh, with the academy. So let me tell you some good news. We've had 84 attendees uh, in our eight uh, Wednesday and Thursday night session. 84 people have come and joined us along the way uh, from uh, the small business centers at Sampson and at uh, at uh, Dublin. So I'm just really pleased with that number because it shows a, a lot of interest in the program. Uh, on Wednesday nights, we've had 60 participants. And on Thursday nights, we've had 24 uh, participants, so that's a lot of people that have been on board. Of course, y'all have seen them come and go as well, but 19 of you have uh, joined us on Wednesday and or Thursday night, so uh, some doubling up there, and uh, that's really good that we can have a program where people can pick and choose one night in case you have to miss a night, you can pick and choose the other one. So it's been a very successful run, and we're just halfway through, actually. And then we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But you are the academy. You are what what I, uh, my dream is, is to put together uh, lots of small business operators in eastern North Carolina and all over the state now uh, who have a common denominator, and that is uh, the, the academy and the mutual helpfulness that we all try to do for each other uh, through the academy and entrepreneurs and associates. Uh, as we finish up our graduation list, I'll send you all the list of those who are, that are members and have graduated. And uh, as you see each other, you can uh, uh, say hello and, and, and uh, try to help each other out. Now, after tonight, we're going to take a one-week break, uh, just to let my voice catch up a little bit, give you all a chance to uh, settle in on your homework and try to finish your assignments and uh, make your business grow, or take a break like I'm going to do. And then uh, on March the 14th, we're going to have an in-person uh, seminar over at the campus at Kenansville. And a lot of y'all, most of you that are on the screen now, are within easy driving distance of the uh, of the campus. And I really want to encourage you to come over for a, 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 a seminar in person, meet John and meet Tanya, uh, see the campus here. I get to meet you, which will be a special treat for me. Uh, and we'll have a, a, a seminar uh, covering the basics of starting an Internet business. There won't be a, th a single thing in that uh, uh, seminar that won't help you, I'll guarantee you. And uh, so it'll be a good learning experience. But mainly, 
we can enjoy the fellowship of meeting each other person to person, maybe even get a few photos together. That'd be great. There's a chance that because several of you have already finished all your homework for your uh, uh, graduation certificates with the academy, uh, there's a chance that maybe we can even present some certificates there. Uh, Sarita, who's with us now, welcome Sarita, will be helping us uh, create the, uh, the certificates of graduation and completion. So there's a chance we might be able to uh, get John and I together to present those certificates to you individually and, and get some photographs that indeed you might be able to use to create some business or at least keep the flies out the kitchen, right? Some <laughs> photographs are used for different things. I'll furnish. Hey, hey Sarita, welcome. How uh, you doing? Good. I know you in the middle, and I know you were talking about the 14th. Um, I will probably need to, to get the certificates done before the 11th because I'm going to be at the beach that whole week. Um, All right. So, yeah, I'm leaving Saturday to the 11th to go to uh, down to the beach. Which beach are you going to? Uh, I think we're going to be down there at Emerald Isle. All right. Well, at Emerald Isle, you can hop right out of there and drive up to Keenansville and be right back within an hour because I've done it a lot of times. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off the hook that easy, I guarantee well, I would if I want the staff to work on the <laughs> retreat. <laughs> I understand. All right, but it didn't, thank you, Sarita. I'll keep that in mind. So hopefully you all can come. I'd just love to meet you in person. And then after that, we're going to go back online on Wednesday nights, not Thursday nights, but Wednesday nights for five more Wednesday nights. And then each night we'll have kind of two – Two short topics, uh, which will give you 10 hours of total uh, uh, learning time, and I'd like for you to do it. The first week on March 22nd, we're going to be a, have a program similar to tonight, but it's going to be more focused on the on the topics. I won't have a lot of interference items. We'll kind of dig deeper into depreciation and uh, and deduction, so you have a better understanding of that before March before April 15th or March uh, 29th. Because all of you now are thinking about adding profit centers, you want to do it with items that don't cost you too much. We'll be talking about 15 businesses that you can start with $100 or less. Uh, uh, first, first half, <clears throat> excuse me. The second half, we're going to be talking about customer service. I've mentioned it a lot. This brings in 40% of your business, but on this night, we're going to actually get into the nitty gritty of different things that you can do to improve your customer service in your business. On April 5th, and uh, was a great seminar because uh, we're going to dig deep into forecasting and negotiating and tie them together to actually give you uh, some uh, uh, examples and experience of how you can apply uh, your negotiating skills and, and do a barter uh, presenting your uh, 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 offers and counter offers. And then on the 12th, we're going to talk about uh, finding and keeping the best employees and becoming a dream manager, which is a really interesting topic about how to help uh, you and your family and your fellow employees see some dreams come true by putting together a structure and a plan. And then we'll wrap up the spring season uh, on April 19th uh, with pricing strategies, digging deep into how to, how to set your prices, and move right into ending that up with little tips to help you comp, uh, conquer the competition. All these are deeper diggings uh, topics than we've done in the uh, in the first seven, uh, which will really help you round out. Now, those of you that's been working on your homework and your assignments but not quite got there yet, uh, that's fine. Uh, maybe you haven't uh, done your quiz yet, and that's fine, because you'll have the whole next five, six weeks to work on that and we'll close it off on the, on the say, the uh, Monday before April 19th to ask you to send in all your information if you want to qualify for your certificates, and we'll work it out as we go. So, so proud to be able to do this and look forward to working with you. Now let me announce that we've had 22 stars among our 84 people. Of course, all of y'all uh, that are on board here with me tonight uh, are in the running. So we've got 22 stars that are really in there with a good attendance record that's going to qualify you to be considered for your certificates, and we want to take it to the next level. And Tamika, you're certainly one of them. Let me say thank you for what you're doing and trying to do. You keep pushing, lady, and, and I'm sure you're going to get there. Uh, we're so happy to, to see you, and we'll see those vending machines around. We're going to put some money in them. You're going to make me happy and be happy too. 
And Kenny, you've been very loyal and very helpful with a lot of other folks. We certainly do appreciate you so much and uh, look forward to uh, hopefully you'll be able to be in Kenansville when we have that face-to-face -face meeting because I'd actually like to see you and, and uh, shake hands with you and, and or any family members that y'all want to bring. You can do that too. Tisha, same thing with you. You'll be right around the corner. I certainly hope you can come and see us. Thank you for the efforts that you're making to keep doing it, and I, I know you're doing a good job, and we want to help you uh, help you with your business. I wanted to ask you, Tisha, are you now to take on all the rations work? <coughs> Is that a part of what you want to do? And because we're seeing more and more people that do that. Uh, uh, is, I, uh, you want to answer that now? I see you've turned on your mic. Yes, um, I can do the alterations. Um, what I'm working on now is um, putting an addition onto the back of my little tiny house. Uh -huh. um, just so I'll be able to work out of just that one space. And, and how's that? that huh? How's that project coming along? Um, it should be completed by um, by May, May, June. And then I'll be full, fully in it. But I still do the alterations, yes. Well, good for you. All right. Looking forward to learning more about that. Thank you. Uh, Ed and Caesar have been with us uh, when they can. They work late. And um, as the lays, days are getting longer, they probably uh, just jump on when they can. But they're so great. Ed, Ed was in our series about seven years ago with his uh, one of his sons, who's now a private contractor doing well. And Got a younger son, Caesar, coming along now. is helping him get started and uh, getting a plan down. Just so very proud of him. So thank you for what you're doing. Amy's been with us uh, regularly. She's working on getting her a venue set up so she can hold some special events. Proud of you, Amy. Thank you. And Felicia, the same way over in, in uh, the Willard area. Uh, thank you for what you're doing to help you get your uh, family started. Uh, Sarita's always a... a our quarterback and willing to help us any way she can and, and does in so many ways when she's not down at the beach anyway. But uh, so Sarita, I think that maybe you just ought to invite all of us to come down and be with your crowd at the beach and we'll just have a big time. How about that? <laughs> uh, Monique was with us our first few weeks. I uh, lost touch with her, but uh, maybe she'll be coming back, but she really gave us some good videos and happy faces and bought a, uh, a lot of great images that we all can learn from how to make a better business. And Amanda, you know, she's perking right along now. She's working on getting her kitchen started over in Wallace and Chickapin, where she's going to have a sweet kitchen bakery. I like the sounds of that. Uh, so we all can uh, get some sweets from uh, from Amanda. But i got to say, we have uh, two folks that have really just been above and beyond and took the extra 100 miles down the road to make the Academy a success and show us all how to get things done. And of course, Penny was uh, is, is one of them over in Wilmington uh, with, with her uh, Resin Redhead logo and new video and and per, uh, portrayal of, of uh, how, to, how to market things. Just so proud of her uh, coming on board. And there's Caesar and Ed. We were just talking about you. Glad to have you on board with us tonight. We've just been bragging on you. Uh, but Penny has just gone the extra mile to, to do things right and professional. And I think we're going to see a lot more out of her in the next few weeks even. Uh, I think she's thinking about doing some uh, 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 virtual assistant work in different areas, and therefore we all could benefit from what she's offering, just like we do from Sarita, uh, to, to uh, help everybody get more things done. But our shining star, and she's not, not logged in yet when we didn't brag on her anyway, is Vanessa McIntosh in Burnsville. She has put so many hours during this course of study to to, to uh, upgrade her business, to do uh, more and more about marketing, uh, kind of got out of her shell and uh, helped us with the video. Remember, she gave us a raw video. Now, I love all of you, but I love Vanessa because she actually turned the talk and I'm thinking about doing it into doing things to show us all, me included, some new ideas and new ways. So in, in this series, she has come forward and put together a marketing campaign that she's able and has it online now, and it's already starting to produce uh, sales and interest in her private line. 
that's the beauty of this, guys. If you if you actually do it and put these things to work in a good way, they can start helping you make money and improve cash flow and, and start making long-term customers today. So let's take a review of what Vanessa has put on board and put together. Now, she's been in business several years, uh, seven, eight, nine years I've uh, been in business, but kind of just sleeping and rocking along. But she has determined to have an explosion of marketing and really try to pump it up. And she sent me a note today saying she wasn't able to join us last night because her phone had been ringing all day and emails coming in with new orders. So, hey, that's the problems we want to have, right? So, Vanessa, here we go. Let's take a look at what you've been up to. First of all, she has uh, gave us good images uh, with her market center. She has given us a good menu that she can put online about what she's selling and did it in a very professional way. So it's uh, created uh, this image that can be put on Facebook or on her websites or sent out an email. So talking about the different things she's selling, including challenge coins, patches, T-shirts, hats, and other things. Uh, Good-looking image promoting Americanism all the way. Then as we ask her to do and as we're asking you to do, she took each one of those profit centers and came up with target marketing groups or niche markets because it's the niche markets that's, that's going to uh, pop in a hurry. When you when you can get a product that is directed at a certain group of people that are kind of banded together or they communicate a lot, they share information with each other, those niche markets that help you promote your company so much faster, and that's really good. Uh, Tamika, when you can really satisfy a certain group of salons or barber shops or uh, uh, American Legion Post, uh, something like that, and then you then you get a list of the other Legion Post or shops in that area and target that as a target marketing group, you'll see your business just skyrocket because you'll have a base of good customers that can help you do that. So uh, Vanessa went on and, and uh, uh, gave us that raw video. Remember the raw video that she gave us to uh, help promote her business? Uh, let's, let's remember what that was and see if we can play it here. Turn your microphone up. It's taking a few minutes to load. I don't know why, but we'll see if it does. Let's go back. Well, I may have done something wrong with her video, but you all may remember it where she's sitting there with her with her baby daughter and uh, selling her product. Um, I'm sorry and apologize for not having her video where it's playing. It should be loading now. So I don't move on, not hold you up. Then she went on to uh, put her core values up here. Uh, in, in, in a nice way that is easy to look at and uh, talks about it. So she can use these uh, these core values and items as marketing tools in a really beautiful way. Uh, Kenny, I can see you doing similar things. and uh, you, You'd have your truck, uh, good pictures of your truck up here out on the highway and uh, lots of colors and things. Uh, I've never had anyone to take the core values, mission, and vision statements and turn them into marketing tools like Vanessa's here fantastic here's our mission statement all dressed up and pretty uh, with that type of look and hook image people will take a minute and look at it and read it and therefore should get the benefits of it and then there's the uh, vision uh, vision statement she's done in the same manner so just real happy that she was able to do that and share it with us and uh, I, I'm just happy that we use this as a lot and then she went the mile further. One of your homework assignments was to do testimonials as she could. And she wrote a very impressive testimonial about how much value the uh, the uh, the work that we're doing here at the Academy has been for her and uh, used some very nice words. I'm going to share this with you in an email and ask you to consider doing the same thing. The more that we can promote the small business centers, the more fun yes. The more uh, funds and resources they get to to help us all do that, so I'm hoping that we can do it. I don't have to mute some mics. We're getting some background noise now, so y'all excuse me just a minute. Okay. So uh, 
think about writing a testimonial, if you would, for the series, uh, for the academy, for what it's meant to you, if it's been a good deal for you, so we can encourage other people to, uh, to do it as well, and let the uh, operators, the directors at the small business centers know that uh, you're appreciating what I'm doing and what the academy is doing for, for everybody. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Vanessa, for going the extra mile to doing that. Uh, Sarita will be fixing you up some really nice looking certificates uh, that you uh, appreciate and put them in frames and go from there. And the academy as well, so you don't get two sets, one from the, uh, the uh, uh, community college and then one from the academy. And go, if you go the extra mile uh, you, with your homework and all, you'll get uh, even more uh, uh, extra mile appreciation award. So your study guides tonight uh, that were sent to you uh, have several uh, handouts talking about our, our topics of the, uh, discussion. Uh, your quiz I've sent to you. Uh, uh, this quiz is one that's got blanks in it that you're going to need to fill in for your answers. It's also got a place for you to give me the way that you want your name put on the certificate and also your exact mailing address because we're probably going to be mailing the certificates to you. So make sure you get that just like you want it and we'll try to uh, fix you a better looking uh, certificate. Uh, remembering that we still have five more online lessons and one more in-person lesson. So moving into our topic of, uh, of work tonight is record keeping, depreciation, taxes, and selling secrets that no one else has talked to you about, but I will. Remember those drill skills, and this is another way to get an extra mile award, is uh, owning the drill skills, every one of them. Read them, look at the videos, make them a part of your business thinking. Part one, record keeping. To pay taxes, and to keep up with business and to serve our customers, we have to keep up with our records. And y'all are just getting started in your business, most of you. So let me just tell you right now, you want to go ahead and buy, buy a filing cabinet, a four-drawer filing cabinet or a five-drawer, so that you'll be able to keep up with your documents, your history, your certificates, your invoices, all the things that a business generates. Folks said when computers came out that we wouldn't have any more paper records. Well, that's been proven 100% wrong. So you'll need papers, a place to keep your blank papers now and your blank envelopes and filing. And then as you use them and, and turn them into documents, you'll have need a place to store them. So just go ahead and get you a business filing cabinet now so, and some file folders and stacker uppers so you can uh, start keeping your records in one place and they won't get lost. Uh, maybe you say, I don't have any records yet. Well, you will. Uh, you don't have some checkbooks, and you don't have some invoices and some paper and uh, pencils and uh, office supplies. It, uh, get organized and get ready to go. But mainly, keep it up with records is about uh, uh, being ready to, to file our taxes, to, to help customers when we have to pull something back out of the, out of the uh, history to help a customer move forward. So you, you're going to need to do that. Now, there's such a thing as that little flash drive that sticks into your computer. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, that, that flash drive or thumb drive, as some people call it. Uh, they're great, and you want to have three or four of them and go ahead and get the high-capacity ones so that when, as you're working on projects, you can stick it in and save it, and that way you can carry it to another computer or another drive or maybe to me or to an office supply place to get something printed. Flash drives are very handy, and I suggest that you get in the habit of keeping one with you all the time. When you do that, you'll be surprised at how often that you'll be able to pull something off of it that you needed or save something that you want to. More and more uh, devices are using flash drives now, and uh, so, so just get used to what they can do for you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you send me a note, and I'll need to get you up to date on it because it's going to be very, very important. There are a lot of places that you can keep your records. Uh, uh, Off-site software companies, uh, uh, certain devices that will download your computers all the time. Uh, maybe you're not at that point yet, but I want you to know that you do that. And there's some accountant records that you're going to keep for a long time, so you don't want to find a place to do that. Think about where are your records now and where are you going to save them. Are they going to be safe? Are they going to be dry? 
or they're going to be out of the way of any possible floods or fires. Think about how safe they're going to be for the long term because some of these paper documents and I guess computer files as well, you're going to need to keep forever, permanently, on and on and on, permanently, okay? And they would include your LLC uh, documents, your uh, accountant audit reports, any copyrights or patents that you have, uh, uh, stocks and bond registers if you've done that, or, and your deeds and mortgages, and of course your your vehicle uh, registration license and certificates of ownership uh, titles and things like that. You need a place that you know where they are and that they're safe. Depreciation schedules, end of year things, uh, tax returns, your related documents, and also your trademark res uh, uh, registrations. So that's one reason that you want to go ahead and get a good filing cabinet because one of your drawers is, needs to be labeled permanent records. Okay? Permanent records. And, uh, yeah, if, if you uh, feel like they're, that they're private and confidential, uh, then get a, a filing cabinet that's got a, a, a lock on it so you can keep it locked if you need to. <clears throat> After you cross out of that list of permanent record things, every, there's a, a whole other list of items that you need to keep at least seven years. Seven years is a long time. Some stuff you just don't be able to throw away as soon as you finish with it. I'm not saying you have to keep everything but some things you do have to keep, and I've got them listed out here for you. Bank statements, uh, tax records, employee records, things like that. And one thing on this sheet we need to take a minute on, that's bills of lading. Uh, maybe you had not ever heard the term bill of lading, uh, but that is the term that's used for a shipping document. Uh, if you, ship a, a, you sell something and you ship it to someone, uh, that's the record of the shipping, who, who shipped it and where to. We have to keep bills of lading, especially if we're selling out of state. And because out of state, sometimes you won't charge sales tax to something going out of state for various reasons. Sometimes you have to charge sales tax, so you, but you will know depending on the type of business you're in. But if you didn't charge sales tax on it, you're going to need a proof of where it went to, a proof of where, where it was shipped. So you might be able to say to the uh, to your person you're buying from if you're, using, if you're doing direct ship somewhere, to ask them to put on their invoice the shipper and the pro number. And that, that's good enough. That way you don't have to see all the uh, original documents. So keep in mind that when you're selling out of state, you always want to get a list of how it was shipped and be able to prove it. Uh, that way if you have an audit and you hadn't charged sales tax on an invoice, uh, the auditor asks you to show them the bill of lading or proof of shipment. Uh, cash records, contracts and leases, employees after termination, and different types of expense reports for seven years. Seven years is the law, but I like to recommend that you do it for eight years. That extra year is important because lots of times after we box up our tax records during the course of the year, months, even uh, uh, sometimes a year later, uh, uh, here comes a document or a bill that really should have been saved last year or a year before, and you know it's an important tax document, but we're not going to go back into the storage room and unbox everything and put it in just the right place, or I don't do it. What I do, I take that record and I'll put it right on the top of my this year's st stack and just leave it right in there because I know that each year if I have to go find something that's out of place, I just take the top of my box off and it'll be right on top if it was for a previous year. So I keep stuff for eight years. And uh, even though the law says seven, uh, tax returns, invoices, payroll records, castle checks, uh, property tax payments, things like that. You don't have to keep them, so it gets you a filing cabinet. Uh, uh, as you're just getting started, you know what? You, you can just start out first year, second year, third year. So 2023, 2024, uh, you can go ahead and get filing cabinets and put different years on them. And that would be an easy place to go toss something in, and then uh, you can have somebody help you with the filing later or set it up in, in, uh, in folders. We're in an area that has floods and, uh, and tornadoes and hurricanes, and sometimes we'll have areas, it seems like about every other year, where FEMA will come in and a certain area will be able to get some low-interest loans or some grants and aid uh, from the government. Uh, 
but those grants and aids and things, uh, special favors aren't going to happen if you don't have your tax records uh, and your uh, profit and loss uh, papers, because what they do is 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 help you get started based on how much money you lost. And if you go there and you say, well, because I was closed down for these particular months, I lost uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars in, in profits. Well, they're going to say, well, prove it. And you're going to need the paperwork to prove it. So I mentioned this, that as you're saving items, and if you think this might come into play in your type of business, you'll want to keep your, your, your uh, uh, tax records related to profit and loss and income and, and, and uh, 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 cash flow type things. You'll want to keep those, maybe an extra copy of those, in a place with your insurance forms, your what we would call our disaster file, uh, uh, important records that you would need in case of a disaster. So just keep that in mind. It may help you out. It helped me out a whole lot uh, one time when we had a hurricane up this way. <clears throat> now we're going to talk a little bit about depreciation. You've heard that term a lot, uh, depreciation, but now we're going to talk about it in a business sense, about how it affects you more than just uh, real estate or a car. Depreciation is a big, big factor in every business, and it and we could have a eight to fifteen hour lesson on depreciation and still not cover all the ins and outs. But tonight we will do the, do the basics, which I think will help you get started. But the good news is, I searched the internet uh, last year and found uh, this uh, 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 article that was written by Lisa Borga, uh, giving a, a simple two-page explanation for people to understand how depreciation affects you in business. And she, she uh, explains things out in a very professional way and an easy way to understand. So that's why I shared it with you, because you can basically uh, uh, read this uh, while you drink a cup of coffee and set it down to the side, and then the next day pick it back up and skim it again so it kind of soaks in, and then put it away in your new filing cabinet so that if you need to talk about depreciation some more, you'll have something uh, to help you do it. So this is a real good reading, and I'm happy to share it with you. Now, we're going to talk about the basics and the depreciation. What is it? What is depreciation? What it is is a reduction of value in an asset. It's the reduction of value in a tangible thing that you own. It's a reduction in value of some property that you have. But all these things in business world we call assets. But over time, things reduce in value or depreciate in value. When you bought a new car or a new anything at the store, uh, the very minute that it left the store, it lost some of its value because it wasn't new anymore. And then as you use it and it wears and this and that, and some of the warranty goes away or Maybe you get a scratch or a dent on it, it reduces its value even more. Well, depreciation is the business method that we use to record this loss of value in our books. Because when we buy something that we want to keep and make it an asset of our company, when we buy something that we keep and want to make it an asset of our company, then indeed we're going to need to keep up with it in the depreciation file depreciation sheet of our business and uh, brings it in. And uh, so it's really important that you get a handle on what this is and what it uh, can do for you. Let's say that you have just uh, purchased uh, or you just got in business and you have salted, you, you, you got business started with $10,000 and you got that $10,000 cash in the bank. So today your business is worth $10,000. That's pretty easy to figure that out, right? Today it's worth $10,000. But tomorrow you need to kind of get started, and what you need to do is let's say you need to buy an industrial saw or a, 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 a trailer or a tool or a sewing machine or something to bake with or something to make uh, challenge coins with, and you're going to need to spend $5,000. Well, so you're going to take that $5,000 out of the bank and you're only going to have 5000 left. So the question I want to ask you is when you do that, does that mean your company value worth goes away 
by half or $5,000 because that cash still isn't in the bank, right? Well, the answer is no because the saw that you bought and its value at five grand means that your company is still worth 10000 because it owns that saw and that saw is an asset. The saw is a tangible asset and it's still there worth $5,000 the first day you buy it. But when you set it up and get it home, it's worth $4,999. It's, it's going to start depreciating in value the very, very first day. So we have to account for that in our business records so we don't keep it and keep up with how much it's worth to us. So you still got 5000 in the bank. You still got that brand new saw worth 5000 So today, uh, your company is still worth book value 10000 bucks. But here's the deal now. We're going to use that purchase of that saw to, number one, make money. But that purchase of that saw is going to make us money otherwise because we're going to be able to depreciate it and lower our taxable income for five years if we set it up on a five-year plan so that we're able to pay less tax. That's right. So the first year... It's going to be on our books at the 5000 that we sold it for. The second year, it'll be a book value of 4000 2000 1000 and after five years, zero. So the value of that saw goes down uh, according to how many years that you divide it by and set it up on your books. And you've got some flexibility. Uh, it varies year to year on how many years that you can depreciate things. So but it's a five-year depreciation. So what's that got to do with our taxes? Well, as the value comes down over here, the book value of that saw, the book value means the value that we put it into our books at. As that book value comes down, we're able to take $1,000 away from our taxable income that year to pay taxes on it. That's exactly right. So we won't have to pay as much money. Now, I didn't say you wouldn't have to pay $1,000 less. But your tax value uh, or your uh, uh, tax exposure figure, taxable income, will be reduced by all your depreciation items. And as you reduce that taxable income, of course, you reduce the amount of taxes. So each year, you're, uh, you get a, a, a bump, a, a deduct of, uh, of $1,000, and that's called taking a depreciation deduction. Okay? Depreciation reduction right there off of your book value. So let's talk about that just a second. Oops. This is where we're showing, well, I don't come back to this. It, 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 it's come up in a few minutes. We don't talk about business expenses and capital expenses. I see that Christy is with us again tonight. Christy, thank you so much for joining us. And Vanessa, we have just bragged and bragged on you and here you come in tardy and you missed all the uh, great work that I saw all the uh, images that you've been doing thank you so much for your good work and we'll, we'll, we'll show everyone these uh this plan that you got going on often but we're so proud of you and glad you could make it tonight I hope you were selling so many coins today it made you late tonight so there we go so when we're talking about deductions we're talking about business expenses and there's two kinds of business expenses, one and two. There's a general business expense, which we just generally call a write-off. You've heard that term, a write-off, so many times before, right? Well, those are general business expenses where you don't have anything to show for the money that you've shown, but you needed it to keep your business going. That's the, that's the cleaning supplies that you got, or it's the telephone bill, just general operating expenses that after you pay for it, you needed it, but you've got nothing to show for it. Well, when you buy something, you have something to show for it, like a tangible thing, and it needs to be tangible. Uh, and that's an asset that stays with you and the business and increases your business's value. That might be a nice desk that you buy or that filing cabinet that I mentioned. That's called furniture and fixtures. Or it might be the air conditioner you put in or uh, tools or computers are, are a big expense and things like that. 
tangible items that last more than a year generally. They're called capital expenses. Those are items that you're buying, tangible assets. And these are the items that will be listed on your depreciation sheet. Depreciation sheet. Assets are listed on the depreciation sheet. The year and date you bought them and how much you paid for them and how much you're going down in value. Everything that you buy. And uh, as long as it's got value and as long as you keep it and decide to keep it on your sheet. So let's talk about what are uh, uh, other items related to the taxes that we need to do. When I talk to a, a CPA, and I talk to a lot of them through the years, I always ask the first question is, give me some good news. Give me something important that the people that I serve, uh, entrepreneurs just getting started in business, give me something important I need to share with them. And every one of them, the first statement out of their mouth is, is kind of like this. Steve, you got to encourage those new people in business to pigeonhole their tax money, to set tax money aside and not spend it uh, because it's, at some point in time you don't have to send it into the government. And it's so easy when you're just getting started. To, you do a big deal and there was a right much tax in into it and you put it in the bank and this and that, uh, or you you had a great year or a great month and you had a lot of payroll and paid your employees and they did well and they went on, but did you set aside that tax money, that unemployment insurance for them, those health benefit things that you have to pay? It's so easy to say, well, uh, my secretary is doing that or my accountant is doing that. i got a bookkeeper that looks after that for me. Let me tell you, you cannot trust this one to someone else. You have to have a rigid plan in place to ensure that you're that you're not using the tax money that that people are paying you as you go. You've got to be real careful because when the tax bill is due at the end of a week or the end of a month or the end of the year, it needs to get out of here because those people have no sense of humor if you're paying late. I mean, they got big hammers that they bust your fingers with with interest and fines if you're late a little bit. So. Learn right away to pigeonhole that tax money to keep you out of the jam. I cannot tell you the hundreds of times in my 63 years doing business that I haven't heard of or seen one of my friends in business in Dunn or in the territory out here get in big trouble because they had spent that tax money. It wasn't that they were trying to do anything wrong. They just got excited and spent the money and didn't have, when it was due, they didn't have it to pay. Well, the ignorance is no excuse here. So make sure you pay attention to me. Pigeonhole tax money and save it so you can pay it when it's due. Business expenses, cost of doing business. What are some regular general write-offs? Rent, travel, paying employee salaries, those are general business expenses and just a flat write-off, no discussion needed. However, capital expenses are items that will last you over a year. They're tangible. They're, you're using them in the business, and not only are you going to be able to use those expenses to help reduce your tax payments, but also if you're borrowing money on them and with terms like amortization and some others, you'll get some benefit from the finance charges that you're paying. Not going to get into all that. That's a whole different lesson. But the, the fact is that uh, capital expenses have a lot to do with how much taxes you have to pay. So let's talk about because you, you're the one that's got the flexibility. You will decide what is a capital expense or a business expense at your business. Let's use the example to talk about printers. Uh, uh, let's buy a $250 printer. Well, if I buy one, and i got one sitting right here, a Hewlett Packard 4520, uh, about 250 bucks, uh, I, will, I will put that on my depreciation list because it will last me probably five or ten years. And I need things on my depreciation list to show company worth. I don't own a lot of tractors or tractor trailers or land or farm equipment. So the little things add up to showing my company has some tangible assets. 
But if I was a big insurance company and had 150 or 200 agents out in the field, and all of them had a printer like mine that they would wear out in a couple of years, I would not put that in my records because it would be a lot to keep up with. i just consider it a write-off and never do it. So the point is each individual business person can determine whether they're going to use an expense as a capital expense or a business expense if it's a tangible. If it's a tangible and lasts over a year, you're going to have the decision to make whether or not you're capitalizing. Capitalize it means turn it into a permanent asset of the company that you're going to keep up with. But a $2,500 printer, most anyone, any business, uh, would would uh, put those on the depreciation ship, sheet and <laughs> capitalize it. But how about the paper? Let's say we bought some cases of paper when we bought those printers. Would that be a capitalized item? Nah. Because you don't use it up within a year. You don't have anything to show for it. So the paper would be a regular business deductible expense. Set of tires, $2,000 set of tires. In my business, when I bought a 2,000 set of tires, of course, it might cost 6,000 now, but back then, I would depreciate a, a set of tires, 2,000 bucks, because they were going to last me a while. But we can't even run in a trucking company or someone that owns a lot of buses and such as that. They go through tires so often, they probably never capitalize a set of tires. It just considered operating expense. I don't want to keep up with it. <laughs> By the time I got it into the books, I probably need another set. So, no, nah, but two different businesses look at it two ways. If I bought a brand new engine for my truck and used to be able to buy an engine for around 17000 I guess they're four times that now, but most everyone would, would de take depreciation uh, on that engine, even though it's not the whole truck. It's a part in that truck that you can keep up with by serial number. So, yes, you could capitalize it. Now, what if you were renting a truck while you were working on your own? Did you capitalize the rental? Nah. You can't call that a part of the repairs even. It's the rental. So rental is always a direct expense, as leasing is always a direct expense, an uh, instant write-off. Payroll, direct write-off. CPA fees? direct write-off. How about a $4,000 set of tools? Yeah, tools will last a lifetime. You take care of them. Most of them will. So yeah, that would be an appreciated item. But the fact is that most people do not go out and buy a $4,000 set of tools. They buy $50 here and $60 over there. And over the course of a year, might purchase $4,000 worth. So you'd have all those small expenses but if you know that those tools are together and you can put them together as a set and keep them as a set and always be able to say, here's that $4,000 set of tools, then you can group those small purchases together and lump some of that package and, and, and call it a set of tools and put that $4,000 value on it, even though you bought them with a lot of different invoices. You just need to be able to document it and say, there they are right there and take depreciation on them. Now, I was in the forklift business for 30 years and owned a, a large fleet of forklifts that I rented to different people all, all over eastern North Carolina. And uh, some forklifts rented for $1,000 a month, some for more than that, some for less. But now I'm going to say that pretending that I have rented a forklift for $1,000 a month for 24 months. $24,000. But is that a depreciated item? It is not because I didn't own that forklift. I was renting it. But I'll be able to write off every penny of that expense. Every penny of that expense will be a write-off and lower my taxable income by doing that. How about delivery costs for that forklift when they bought it to me? Nah, can't write it off either because I've got nothing to show for it. But after renting the forklift 24 months, I was able to buy it for $5,000. That was part of my rent-to-own plan good way to, to defer taxes by doing that. And so when I bought it, it went on my books at $5,000 because that's the amount I paid for it. But in reality, it was still worth probably nineteen dollars or $20,000. Well, what's the deal there? That means on my books, my book value is $5,000 when the machine is actually fair market value, 19000 
Both, both numbers are right. So this is the main point we'll make right here. Always remember that the book value of a company or the book value of anything on a depreciation sheet has nothing to do with the fair market value. Nothing to do with it. Let's say that forklift is on there at $5,000 and it's worth $19,000. Let's say it's on there at $5,000, but it is beat all to pieces and not in too good a shape and not really worth but $500. It still stays on the books at $5,000. So remember, my friends, my students, book value and fair market value are two different animals. Two different animals, even though, even though they are, uh, click that right. Here. Even though they're they're the same item, you look at them, but have different values. So when you're buying a business or thinking about buying a business or thinking about how much it's worth, you'll look at the book value, but look at it real closely, and you then you consider what is the fair market value of all this because. Something may a, a company may have a book value of ten million dollars, but the fair market value is zero, or vice versa. The fair market the book values may say fifteen thousand dollars, and it may be a a, a, a two million dollar business. Just remember that it's very very important. You're looking at this to determine how much taxes you're going to pay each year based on what you're buying. That's that's the main thing that you're going to do. All right, it's that time of year. Here we are in the 1st of March, and 45 days from now, it's going to be April 15th, and time to do those taxes. Well, now's the time to start organizing. Now's the time to get everything organized and to do it. Uh, uh, you don't need to know a few things about what to do, and if you want to read up on it or you don't have a bookkeeper or a tax advisor to help you and you want to spend a lot of time reading long pages with big words, then you can go to IRS small business uh, tax issues and, and, and have some real good reading. But what I suggest you do first is find you a good, experienced bookkeeper. Or if you plan on keeping your own books, have a good, experienced bookkeeper that will look over your shoulder a little bit. Uh, experience goes a long way. After the bookkeeper does their work, after we talked, like we talked about last week, the, uh, the CPA can look over their shoulder, work out any wrinkles, fix it up, and, and help you file a tax return. I do suggest that in your business that you end up having a CPA to do your tax work because CPAs will are better trained, they know what to do, and they can t they have no qualms about calling up the IRS to help you. And if you have an audit, they'll, they'll stay there with you, provided you've covered that ground when you started your relationship so that they'll help you uh, get through it and represent you. Two words are important, avoidance and evasion. Tax avoidance is a good thing. We want to do that as entrepreneurs. We want to avoid paying taxes, but we want to do it legally. We want to do it that's not going to get us in trouble because when you use the word evasion, tax evasion, that means you're breaking the law by lying, cheating, or misrepresenting. And they don't have a sense of humor about that. They will come to you and penalize you, uh, take things away from you, possibly put you in jail. So tax avoidance is a good thing, evasion not. Avoidance is legal. It helps you take advantage. And tax advantages are out there all over the place. Uh, helps you reduce future tax liabilities. So stay legal. Tax evasion is not legal. You're going over the line, and if you have uh, any doubts about it, you make sure that you uh, you take care of yourself, uh, read up, get some good advice from a, uh, a tax advisor. I am not that, okay? What are the hot buttons that everyone wants to talk about? It's the deductions. What additional ways besides my normal business expenses, what are all those things that I can use to reduce the amount of money that I have to pay tax on. Well, home office deductions will always be asked, and that's about uh, how do I get a deduction for my home office? Well, if your office is actually inside your home, the critical matter is what percentage of space 
does your office take up versus to say the ha the house size? <clears throat> if you had a thousand foot apartment and your office space was 100 feet, that would mean that your office is using up 10 percent of your house, and therefore you would be able to uh, get a, a reduction at 10 percent on uh, or deduction of 10 percent on your normal household expenses, rent. Plumbing, roofing, yard, all those type of things that you'd be able to get a 10% deduction related to that. But that can get real complicated sometime about what that percentage is because the, off, the alder said, is that really an office? Uh, can customers come in and out? Is, uh, is, is it a separate space for customers to be? Do you have a, a bathroom for them? Is it a different entrance? Do you have a sign that, that says this is an office? Sometimes auditors will not have a good sense of humor and ask you real hard questions there. One way to just to kind of kneel that out is for you to have an outside building or an outside detached office uh, where that you can just say, that's my office, it's not my home, and I'm going to rent this office to myself. My business is going to rent this office from me. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can set up a rental agreement each month. Uh, 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 the office, the business can pay you a rental check on that stuff. Now, my outside office that I'm sitting in right here, for more than 20 years, no, for more than 15 years, I've rented this office uh, from myself for $625. So that helps me cover expenses, insurances, and things like that, and uh, gives me some extra income coming to me personally. That income is taxable to me, but it is deductible for the company, so it's kind of a washout. So it's a good way to to uh, to, to uh, pay for some things that would be more difficult if the office was in the house. Meals and entertainment, you just need to keep up with them. And don't go over the line. Meals and entertainment don't mean gambling expenses. It don't mean junkets. It's really when you are working with and for a customer that you get to use it for a deduction. If, however, you're going to a business convention or a training session and it's documented and proved, uh, uh, it, the business can pay your travel expenses, including airline tickets and uh, meals while you're out there uh, doing this thing, but it needs to be proven that it's for, a, a for, for as a business expense. Using your car becomes a real question, and, and uh, folks like uh, uh, Caesar and Ed that are with us tonight, uh, contractors, are always wearing out trucks and vehicles and trailers and back and forth, and so there's a lot of expense in these uh, in, in, in vehicles. Normally, a small business person that doesn't have special equipment, it's better for you to uh, to own your vehicle, and the business, the business then will need to write a check and compensate you and pay you back for the mileage that you're putting on your truck. Now a lot of people don't know it, but the uh, allowable mileage a couple of years ago was something like 55 cent per mile. But we had a, a, an expert tell us last night that. This year is $0.76 cent per mile because the way fuel prices have gone up and vehicle costs have gone up, and it may even go up above $0.76. Cent. So that means that, uh, uh, Caesar, for every 76 miles, for every, uh, let's see, no, for every uh, 100 miles that you drive uh, your personal vehicle doing business, the business owes you back a check for $76. And that can add up to a lot of money. And it's money that you need to be taking because, when again, when the company pays you that money, it's a business deduction from the company to lower its tax numbers. Uh, and that money is not, is not taxable income to you. The travel expenses that the business gives back to you, you don't have to pay tax on that. Pretty good effort. So, but that money you do have to use it to pay for your automotive, gas, insurance, car payments. When you trade, it comes out of your pocket. So, keeping up with your business mileage is really important 
for uh, for contractors that are going here and there. Sometimes it becomes so complicated because uh, uh, repairs and special vehicles cost a lot of money and have need special insurance. At some point in time, when you get more than three or four vehicles, it's going to be better for the company to own the vehicles uh, instead of you owning them personally because you'll save so much money on the uh, uh, on the insurance. But also, it's going to save you a lot of time on keeping up with with uh, itemizing all the repairs and stuff because it's just going to be a write-off for the company, as we talked about earlier. But here's the rest of the story. If you use that company vehicle for personal items, like like you've got a company car or truck that you do your all your personal stuff with, you don't need to keep up with your personal mileage that you use that car and re, re and compensate the company for those miles. Or in other words, if you're using the vehicle to go to the beach or to go to the grocery store and it has nothing to do with doing business and you drive that vehicle 100 miles doing that kind of stuff, you don't need to pay the company back $76. That's right. So you have to keep up with it. So how does somebody deal with that? What I did for a number of years, I drove a company vehicle basically everywhere I went. And basically everywhere I went during those years was pretty much about business. Uh, sometimes, of course, it wouldn't be. But I kept an extra vehicle, a small Jeep or an inexpensive car in my name, I paid, paid the insurance in it, so I could always say that I used that that, uh, that uh, lesser expensive vehicle, that other vehicle, for my personal travel. But if you don't have a vehicle in your name, you're not going to be able to say that. And everything that you do, uh, you'll have to keep up with and pay the company money, and that can add up to some big bucks. Interest that you're paying related to the company is all deductible. Rent, taxes, insurance, business-related items, uniforms, and clothes. Now, I'm new to you talk about insurance for a minute because that can be really important for young folks like y'all. Uh, insurance is a, is a risk management tool. It's a risk management tool that if you die, your business expenses can be paid, uh, debts can be paid off, and your heirs aren't going to be left with a with a big uh, bill to try to figure out what to do with and, or force your company into bankruptcy after you die. So having insurance in place to cover uh, uh, what happens if you pass away and pay your debts, it's a good idea because hopefully that's not going to happen uh, and you don't keep on living and you'll have that insurance in place uh, that can be used to uh, funnel out to your uh, uh, beneficiaries or such as that. As as long as the company is the beneficiary of a life insurance policy, the company can pay 100% of that cost, and it's a tax write-off. You get a great personal benefit out of it, but it's a tax write-off because the company is named a beneficiary. Now, in some states, including North Carolina, and these laws change, so again, this is something you would need to definitely check with your uh, independent insurance agency. In some situations, the company can pay 100% of the bill, and you can get 49% of the death benefits to go to somewhere else. And, and you can have that direct benefit even though you're not paying for that policy with your personal money or your after-tax money. So if that's a situation important for you, you got a lot of children, you're trying to build some education funds up for them, and you'd like to build those funds up through uh, insurance policy cash values, which is a good way to do it these days. Uh, then maybe the company could be paying for those uh, policies and building up a good cash value. And then there's a chance later on down the road when you need to, but because you own the company, you can change the ownership of that policy. That's right. So just give that some thought. Uh, get some good advice on it, but it can be a world of help for you in how to help you uh, put away some money for security with money that the uh, company has paid up paid, and you didn't have to take it out of your taxable income. Tax preparers and collectors are a part of this conversation and very, very important because what you got to do is just put all your paperwork in a paper bag and give it to the accountant. Not. 
Every piece of paper a accountant picks up, there's a price tag to it. So if you can summarize all the little bills, all the gas bills, all the tire bills, all the electric bills, all the insurance payments, all the medical bills, you do all the summarizing you can and put it on one sheet of paper, and that's what you give to the accountant. I'll guarantee you if they need more information, they ask for it, and you can give it to them. But you handing them as few pieces of paper as you can will save you money. And sometimes that's big money. Who is uh, Who's going to collect these taxes from us? Well, there's four different groups of people, the city, county, state, and feds, federal government. Usually, uh, talking about city taxes, you go to city hall, county taxes to your county seat, Talk to the tax collectors there. State government, NCDOR, and the federal government, the IRS. The good news is, is that the state, county, and uh, and uh, and cities generally are easy to talk to an individual. They are very interested in helping uh, entrepreneurs. So I can tell you that it's a good thing. It's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, the state government, of course, is larger, so they have a regional office and a good telephone system. Before COVID, you could just go up to them and have a meeting most any time you wanted to. You set up an appointment and go meet person to person, but because of the COVID stuff, some of that stopped, and they wanted to do online meetings like we're doing. But the news is the state government people are generally really good and go the extra mile to help new businesses get started. Uh, they also are in good contact with the small business center directors. So if you have an issue related to state uh, government and taxes, uh, that director will probably know personally uh, the person that uh, works with entrepreneurs in this area and can help be a liaison for you. The IRS is kind of a different story. They're hard to talk to, hard to get up with. They're so big, so far away, so many people, we're so small. It's hard to get to the right person at the right time on the telephone or, or, or even through email sometimes. We're talking with strangers or, or it seems like a web page is sometimes. So here's what I want to encourage you to think about. If you have an issue with the U.S. government, with the IRS, tax-wise, I suggest that you have a CPA talk on your behalf. Working with the government as an entrepreneur, as a small business person, is, is, is not the most fun thing to do with the U.S. government. So I'm not telling you got to be afraid of them, but I do tell you I advise you to be cautious. And your CPA can talk to them without any problems. They don't even have to tell the, C, the IRS uh, your name or your company name because they can ask the questions hypothetically and get answers back, and you're, you don't, you're not at risk. May cost you a penny or two, but again, that's a good reason to establish a good relationship with a CPA. In the long term, it'll pay you a dividend, especially as your company grows and more issues come along the way. So you don't be paying money, and it might be called taxes or permits or license or estimates or fees, but if it's going to the government, I generally refer to it as taxes. So that's what that's all about. I've given you in your handout how to get in touch with different folks. Uh, here's the uh, information that uh, how to uh, get in touch with the North Carolina Department of Revenue, and I'm giving you other contact points as well. What type of taxes uh, really are coming into play most of the time that we have to deal with? Uh, employee withhold withholding taxes and payments, privileged licenses that we pay to the uh, county and to the or to the county and the state, town and county. Unemployment insurance, which is uh, the state collects that, and franchise taxes. Now, franchise taxes, I want to congratulate you. You're going to get to pay them even though you don't own a franchise. And that's just what they call them. It's called a franchise tax. That is a tax that the federal government and the state government charges everybody that files a return. It's kind of a filing fee. So they're going to get $100 or $200 from you whether you make any money or not. Uh, whether you make any profit or not, which means you usually wouldn't have to pay taxes, they're still going to get a little bit of money from you just to cover the cost and keep the keep uh, wheels grease. So when you see that on your reform, don't be surprised because we are all paying franchise taxes. Now, county taxes are kind of interesting because the, 
the federal government and the state government base their taxes that we pay on our income, on our profit. That's right, on our profit. But counties base their taxes on what you own, your assets. Your property, vehicles, rentals, uh, equipment, other things that you own that are assets. Now, earlier tonight when we were talking about assets, where did we say they were all listed? On the depreciation sheet. So as a business person having a depreciation sheet, you will not be able to list your county business taxes without that depreciation sheet. And those numbers will come right off of that sheet, right over on your tax form. Very easy to do, not a big deal. Uh, you probably won't even have to ask your accountant or bookkeeper to, to file your county taxes, provided you know how to read that depreciation sheet. But this causes a little bit of an issue because in December, usually around December 15th or 20th, you will get, as a business client, if, if you've registered in the county as a business, if you've got that uh, federal identification number or a uh, uh, business checking account at the bank, you're probably going to get a, a tax statement from the county asking you to file all your property for tax uh, pur purposes. You're supposed to file that before either December 1st or Jan excuse me, either December 31st or January 31st. I think it's you need to file it before January 31st. And if you don't, you automatically are charged a 10% penalty on whatever your tax payment is. You have to pay an extra 10% if you miss the filing date. The good news is that you that, that you can't report it and if your accountant is still doing your books, and they probably will not give them back to you before April 1st or April 15th. Accountants wait till the last day to give you your paperwork back, usually. They just, they just uh, put out the fires and uh, have so much business, they, they usually just uh, set a, a date to give people back their returns right about April 15th. So if you don't have your... Uh, Accountants' records back to you, your, 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 your tax statements, you can't fill out the county form. So every county has a website. Every county has a county tax website page that you can go to and request an extension of your county taxes over to April 15th or May 15th, depending on what the dates are for the federal government sets up for tax returns. And without paying any money, they will grant you, gladly grant you an extension, and that extension will save you 10% on your taxes, okay? And keep you in good status with it because that means you're not late filing and you're not going to get somebody raise an audit flag because of that. Audit flag now, none of us want to be audited. It's, it's, it's not a, a fun thing to do. It, it causes anxiety and worry. Uh, even if you've done everything right, you've, uh, tax auditors are just scary type people, and I understand that. The good news is that less than 1% of uh, returns are going to be audited. Uh, and indeed, there are several ways that we can keep from putting red flags up and saying, hey, come on out with me. I'm doing some things here that you want to come and check out. I call them how to avoid red flags. One, dealing with shady tax preparers is a good way to get in trouble with all the tax people. There, are, we, the, the signs are going out in yards right now. Let us do your taxes and we'll guarantee you a big return. Or let us do your taxes and we'll go ahead and pay you now for your return. That is scary because these type folks are generally going to hoodoo your return. They're going to put in information that's going to guarantee a return coming back, even though maybe you didn't deserve it. And when it comes back, they're going to get a piece of it and you're going to get a smaller piece. How about that? So you got to be careful. Open your eyes. If the deal's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Because after that tax money comes back and you're here and they're gone, when the auditor comes, it's you that's going to have to pay the price. Now, tonight you can turn on the TV, and during the next few months, there's going to be a lot of people on TV. Remember these folks that are saying, 
Oh, I ended up owing the government $20,000, and I called this outfit, and they came in, and we got it reduced down to to $2,000. Or I am so thankful that the federal government had me down for $40,000, and I called this outfit, and they came in and helped me reduce it way down. Well, I'm thinking in my mind that anybody that got in that situation probably was dealing with some type of shady preparer if, if, if you got that far behind in your tax payments and it hit you by surprise. Yeah, I know we can get behind in our tax payments, but very seldom is it going to be a surprise if you're dealing with a good tax preparer. So find someone that's been in business a while that can give you some good references. Unreported income gets a lot of people in a jam. I know we all want to fly under the radar and not uh, show all of our income. And, yeah, maybe sometimes people will give you a gift. And you know what? You can accept, I think it's up to uh, $21,000 in gifts and not have to report it as income. Uh, folks can give you tips and things you don't have to report. But there are a lot of things you do have to report in your regular business transactions. So be careful when you're trying when you're deciding what income not to report. Filing on time is important, and a lot of folks just by habit are always late, never get an extension, always late, always paying penalties, and that raises the flag because something's screwed up there. There's a reason for that happening, and the IRS will probably raise the flag on that and come to see you. Well, I hope your filing goes well this year. I'm already started on mine, and I hope you get back a nice return. And if you do have to pay, it's not a lot more than you expected. But we'll see, and we'll keep doing it year after year. We've enjoyed seven weeks together. So let's kind of recap now before we start our next five-week period and and see what, what we can be doing now to help our businesses. Remember, we don't want take-it-or-leave-it marketing. We want to have, we do want to have Raven fan customers. And we want to follow up with them after every sale some way. We do want to feed our database with email addresses every chance we get to grow that database because that is growing the people, the, the number of folks that we can send our promotions to. We do care about the mobile pages, our main mobile page and the mobile pages for each one of our landing pages at our website. They are super important. We do want a Google My Business account or My Business at Google or Google Maps, whatever you want to call it. We do want that as soon as that we can get it. And we want a to-do list in it. Now we know that web pages are important, but selling and landing pages are the most important because that's where we can hook the people, get them to get, send us some money, and, and help us have cash flow. We want to highlight your testimonial pages. We want customers to send you testimonials, and you want to send others testimonials doing an exchange because testimonials are the way that you reduce anxieties from folks. In today's world, videos is the most powerful bomb that you, you can do to explode and energize uh, your sales campaign. More videos, more money, more cash flow. Being the best person you can be and remembering the Magic marketing moment, that was the key. That was the key to what we have uh, to to uh, uh, do things is so important. Uh, uh, Vanessa, turn your microphone on and share that with the whole crew. So prior to us going over how important videos were, I was so self-conscious, I guess. I don't know. I didn't like to be in front of the camera at all, and I never posted videos to our social pages, our website, nothing like that. Then Mr. Steve encouraged us to do at least one video, and I'm telling y'all, they're so important. It's completely changed our our business. So many more customers, so many more contacts, so many more conversations. It's creating relationships, just that one effort to see someone in person, especially with their beautiful baby in the lap, and, and hearing your voice, it, it makes you a human being instead of a web page. Is that, is that what you're experiencing? 110% correct. 
Uh, people like to see somebody. They don't want to see just a web page that they're talking to or somebody typing something out on social. They want to see you and what you can bring to them. Well, so important, uh, and I'm glad that you're uh, t testimonial to that. I really appreciate you writing another testimonial just about the videos and what, what we've done, and that will help encourage other people to try it and s to start. I was the same way. I didn't want to be on video. I do not have a video face. <laughs> but Nancy, you got a beautiful video face. I certainly don't. I'm just a ugly old codger. But didn't make any difference. Folks wanted to know who they were dealing with and and uh, and, and do business with a human being uh, that's not trying to be fake. So thank you so much for that testimony, and we'll pick it up a little later. Let me tell you now, the rest of this lesson is not going to be sales 101 like you're in kindergarten. You're past that point. It's not going to be sales 202 like you, maybe you've been around a while or 303, like you kind of sophisticated. Nah, we got to move to 404. We're not going to take the time to go through all the lessons tonight. I'm going to tell you exactly the way I feel. This is all personal opinion, but it's based on experience and observations and what other people have told me in person. So welcome to Sales 404. This is the point where I'm going to tell you the other people secrets about selling that other people want because they feel like you're a competitor. You're not my competitor. We're all in this together for mutual help, and, and I am happy to share this. If I step on your toes, I apologize up front. But I'll do it again if I think it will change you into being a better salesperson to end up closing more deals. <clears throat> up to now, we've talked about A, B, C, D, which is always connect the dots, and that's so important. But tonight we're going to talk about ABC, which means at times we have to be all about closing. Always be closing is our method because closing those deals is, is when you turn to phone calls and the emails and the questions, we have to take that information and close the deal. And that's what we're so much after. People have to trust you and like you to do business with you. Your enemies are not going to do business with you. People that don't like you are not going to come to see you. So we have to build trust, and we have to give them the opportunity to say, well, maybe they're okay. And just as Vanessa said, one of the best ways to do that is a simple video where you're putting it out, of, hey, here I am. I'm proud of my little business, and I want to do business with you, and that will draw people in like a magnet. There's five assumptions going on out here in the world of salesmanship that are causing really good people to lose lots of business, and they don't know it. A lot of things going on that can be changed in a, just a split second to help someone double and triple their sales. So I'm going to go over a few of them, and you probably know some more. And if you do, how about sending me a note on some things that you know that people are doing wrong that I need to put on this list to help folks. It's not okay for me to stop talking to you about a business deal or, or while we're creating a new relationship just because my phone rings and somebody wants to talk to me. Because you and I know both that half the time the phone rings, it's some type of spam call or it don't make a bit of difference. And you and I both know that indeed people will leave a message. Now, I know you may look at it, it may be an emergency, and that's a different situation. I'm not talking about that. But you do not stop uh, building your relationship while talking with a customer or taking a phone call or saying, I need to send a text message. The message you are really sending to them is, you don't count as much to me as me getting to play with my phone. And how many of us now are seeing Everywhere we go, people are tied down to that telephone. I was at the VA last week and went into a, a place uh, to, in a waiting room, and there was eight people in there, eight people in that waiting room. And you know what? Every one of them had their uh, uh, cell phone in their hand. I'm trying to turn my light off my phone here. Can you see that? Isn't that crazy? Sucker won't go off. There we go. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Be careful. Don't don't be addicted to the phone. 
because in my opinion, sometimes if you're out here working with customers or trying to sell things, if you're addicted to the phone, then you're allergic to making sales. So let's not go there. If I'm going to someone's office, if I'm not riding a car with them, if I'm meeting them for the first time or going up to their home, I don't need to be bringing in a strong cologne odor that I have soaked myself down with a strong perfume that will turn people off. I don't need to go in there with my with my clothes smelling like cigarettes or cigars. I sure don't want to go out there with my tobacco cup that I'm spitting into. And maybe you just giggle with that, but let me tell you, across North Carolina, across our mountains <laughs> and our and our hills and such, it's a beautiful place. But there's a lot of beautiful people out here spitting tobacco spit in cups today in 2023, and some of them are calling themselves salesmen. And there's folks that just love their pets. If they're not beside them in the car or all the time with them, they're trying to carry them into someone's office to talk business or this and that, or they smell like uh, the, the pets that they just left. In this world today of allergies, people have sensitive noses, and especially those that have decided to quit smoking or don't want to be around it. And if you're a salesperson that's coming into their environment, Man, you're putting it right in their face. And they may be nice to you. They may smile and talk and chit-chat. But as you're leaving, what they're saying was, I hope that lady never comes back in here again. I don't ever want to see him again. I don't, I don't like the way he smells. And I sure don't appreciate his spitting habits. Know how important that is. Okay? Now, we have to deal with both sides of it. If we're the person, person that's, that's trying to make the sale and this same person comes into us, you know what I used to do? I used to get up out of my office and say, let's walk outside and get some fresh air. And I'd talk to them outside. I wouldn't ever put them down for what they were doing, but I'd sure move them to another place so that I could breathe. But I still wanted their money and, and, and still do and, and find a way to do it. That's one thing I'm nice about online sales. That's part of what you don't have to deal with. Now, I've got strong political views, as you've probably already figured out. But let me tell you that in America today, with the 50-50 right down the line, with some people so far out in left field and out in right field, uh, they're in their own balloons, but they got their money in their own balloons, and I want their money, but I don't want to debate politics with them. And I know if they knew how, how I felt about their politics, they wouldn't do business with me. That's right, so... What I really love is when I can run across and have a relationship and a contact and learn about uh, five-star logistics, which is, hey, I don't care about your politics. We're all Americans here. That is a great message to send out. I don't care about your politics, but I love all veterans. That is the message you want to send out. Yes, my flag is the American flag. That's the message you want to send out. Now, I have customers every day right in the middle of talking about buying a piece of equipment company. They come out with some type of slur about a politician or has some type of radical statement. It is ingrained. You think you're talking with Mr. Pella uh, <laughs> all of a sudden with some type of uh, radical opinion that they might have. It is amazing. Be careful. Be careful. Whatever your sex, whatever your color, whatever your nationality is, people will try to draw you into that to fill you out and find out where you are. And if you're on the wrong side of their politics, they won't give you any money. So be smart about that because it is a big deal in today's world. Another factor is if someone's on the phone in their office and you're walking up and getting ready to talk to them, do not go into the environment where you're going to hear what they're saying back and forth. That is rude. And even people might invite you in or come on over. I'll be through in a minute and give you that finger like that. Come on in. It's okay. You do not do it. And you will be respected by not doing it because you just don't know when that conversation is going to turn or when they get another call and have to uh, talk about it and guard what they're doing. And they don't want to be having this conversation because you're in the room, but they won't say anything about it. So what's right? If you're talking with a customer and you're trying to do business, 
then you're sure not going to start a phone conversation, but they may get a call. And they're not trying to build a relationship. They're just they're talking to you. And they may take that call. Well, when they do take that call, you need to kind of back out and get away from here in distance. That's the polite thing to do. That's the polite thing to do. Follow up. When you send a quote out, when you have someone calls you up and you give them information and you send a quote out and you hang the phone up or you don't send them another email, remember this. It's up to you to follow up with them to see if they have any questions. Remember I've said all through this series, sometimes we have to be assertive and maybe it don't feel comfortable calling this person up after they call you, but if you're not going to get that order because they call someone else or they just uh, didn't feel like they're ready to close the deal and maybe you can encourage them, some people want to see that you're excited about doing it, that you care. So, yes, you do follow up with people when you can because it's up to you to keep the, the deal alive. Say it, take it, or leave it, but when you give them that quotation, that may get the message that they, they sent. You gave them the, the, the price that they were interested in. You told them how much it would be. And somehow or another, you didn't get around to saying we can negotiate this some way or they didn't give you that chance. So when they hung up the phone, they were thinking they were getting a take it or leave it offer. This is big. But if you call them up the next day or send them a message and, and say, look, I want just to make sure that we didn't have any questions or talk about some ways you might be able to save some money on this deal, then you're going to bring energy back into that proposition. So yeah, this means taking a lot of management. So Vanessa just mentioned she's getting telephone calls and giving out quotes. But the key here is the magic market moment is saying, well, let's call back and follow up so we can get more information. Not only will you find out if you're still in the game, you'll find out maybe why you didn't get the deal, and you needed to know that. Price was a little high, freight was a little high, they didn't like this or that. You get a chance to talk to them, and, and then you'll know what's next. It's a smart thing to do to follow up. The deals are not in the bag. Other competitors are out there after your deal, so you have to be a, take the initiative to follow up. Urgency is real. People are impulsive. They, they, they care about uh, uh, getting things done in a hurry. It's up to you to, to answer your phone, to follow up, uh, to answer your emails. Know that folks are in a hurry to get to you and know that the competition is out there beating the drums to try to get the business from you. Now, in Sales 404, you don't need to be the gorilla, the assertive person. You don't need to be the smart one. Not the know-it-all, but the one that's kind of got a plan because that's what we have to do. Here's your tips. Never, ever give away all your information. There are tidbits that you want to keep personal, and you just don't want to give it away. Your business is not everybody else's business. Never itemize your quotations that you don't have to. Never break it down because that's the exact place customers will start nitpicking to try to get a discount or call somebody else. We need to consider every promotion, every quote, like it's a work of art and it's a promotion in itself. We just don't need to say, <clears throat> uh, this hay baler I've got is a really nice hay baler and I'll sell it to you for $5,400. Uh-uh. We need to say, this Farm Max model FM303 is the best hay baler in America. It's got more quality in it. It's easier to use. It'll last you a lifetime, and it really holds its value. And for you today, for you today, I can sell it to you for $5,900. And if we talk a little bit, maybe we can save, figure out a way to save you some money. Notice I said 5900 and not 5400 I made a better presentation by raising the price because I created a conversation that's getting ready to start. And indeed, we may negotiate down some, but maybe I can close the deal at $5,600 because we hadn't talked about the freight yet. We hadn't talked about the tax yet. We hadn't talked about the deposit yet. Every time you get a chance to, quote, kick yourself in gear and become a salesperson and put some pizzazz to it, that's what makes it happen. But don't tell who your vendors are, your contractors, or your manufacturers, because with the Internet today, someone can go right straight to whoever it is that you've been buying from and maybe buy it from themselves. So you guard to guard that information and do it.
Some people just can't say, yes, I'll take it. Some people will save money for years to buy something, but when it comes down to saying, yes, I'll take it, they just can't bring themselves to do it. It's hard for some folks. At the very last minute, they say, you know, I'd rather have that money in the bank than to buy this thing from you. And, and, and just go into uh, hives almost. They, 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 they won't say so bad. They, they look so sad. It looked like this little baby girl here. I mean, it's a, it's a serious thing. So what can we do to help uh, get these people past all these anxieties? And, and here's the way you do it. And this is sales 404. This is what you're not going to get taught in college. This is not what you're going to find out at uh, Workman's Business School. Uh, this is what you find out with years of experience, and I'm glad to share it with you. The little things is what makes the difference. You want your presentation to be a work of art. You want your paperwork to be ready. You want to know what it says. You want to have your frequently asked questions. So when it's time to close the deal, you're there. You're ready. You know how you're going to act. Remember we talked about negotiating and forecasting. You're going to think ahead about how this it will probably go so that you'll be the pro in the room. So that you will be the pro in the room. In your quiz, which y'all seen, how about Dr. F. A. Mesmer? You remember him? Well, you may not have heard of him before right now, but we're going to talk about it a little bit because a great word, he came up with it. He was a great thinker, and he came up with the idea and understanding mesmerizing. Uh, what a great asset that has been to him. And let's talk about that, road, me, that word mesmerize. From this night forward, this word can make a major difference in your business life. From this night forward, this simple word mesmerize can make the difference tenfold, twentyfold in how about the deals you do, the profits you make, the friends you make, and what you accomplish. Because when it comes right down to it, there's always a minute, a few seconds in every negotiation where it's going to go right or it's going to go wrong. And you understanding the importance of mesmerizing has a lot to do with it. <clears throat> I first met the word mesmerizing and started understanding it when I watched my grandchildren watch SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> I like those SpongeBob too. But they would sit there in front of that television and be fixed on it. I guess I was the same way with Mickey Mouse and other people, but I didn't understand how they could just go into a trance watching that, and no matter what else was happening in the room, they became mesmerized with that, and that was the only thing they were listening to. It's like the uh, synonyms say here, hypnotize, uh, enchant, fascinate, uh, spellbound. These are powerful words. And friends and neighbors, I'm going to give you that power. You're going to take that power because it is important for you. In everything you do from this day forward, understanding the power of mesmerize can make a big difference for you, and you will have so much fun in the process. Mesmerizing is taken for the reality that selling and closing deals and convincing people, persuading people, is just like a, a, a drama on the stage. It's just like the drama on the stage, that you've got to get their attention and, and you do things that make that happen. We all go to church and we have our favorite pastors, and some pastors are so skilled at presenting their, their, their message with the right words and the right gestures and their head movements and raising and lowering their voice at the same time. Maybe sometimes just taking a, a silent break. And after taking that break, you're going to hear what the next words are because you're tuned in. And, you know, they have the, the music director exactly ready to start that, that little music when he gets to a place like he's going to do an altar call. They start that little music playing to set the mood. That's important. They choose the right hymns to use so that the message in the hymn goes along with the message in the sermon. That's right. And we need to follow that leadership that they give us, that organization and leadership, when we're planning our selling and our, our closing techniques because it's just going to be very, very important for us to do that. 
we're talking now about the little things that make such a big difference because the magic moment for mesmerizing can be seen very easily with one of your children that's got colic or just can't go to sleep at night and they've been screaming for hours and you've been walking around you love them you don't know why you love them right then but you love them even though they're screaming your ear off and you're wearing your hip out rocking them back and forth or doing everything you can do to quieten them down so they go to sleep but it ain't working so let's go get in the car and drive around the neighborhood because riding in the car sometimes I tune them down we do whatever we have to do to make it work and at some point <laughs> at some point You'll look down in that sweet baby's eyes and see that three-pointed smile they have. And they'll look up at you and they'll go, oh, that's the aha moment. The aha moment. And you know at that aha moment, that child has given up his anxieties, is willing to fight, and it says, oh, I think I'll go on to sleep. I think I'll go on into peace. We've all experienced that probably. Well, that aha moment is what you're looking for when you're selling. You, the, the customer has to get rid of those anxieties that was telling them not to say yes and do that. And the way you do that is they got to like you. They got to keep talking to you. They got to trust you. And you do that by keeping the conversation alive and, and, and learning how that relationship works. And, and you can do it on the telephone. You, know, you can do it with certain types of things that you say and do in email. You can certainly do it with videos and certainly do it in person. But they have to come to like you. You have to talk about the common denominators and, and why this is a good deal for them, why, that, why that they want to buy this and, and you're going you're gonna to sell it to them in such a way, good way. You know, lower your voice maybe. Might even take your glasses off and look at them right in the eye. Have that eye contact so they know you're being sincere. You're saying things that you're ready to back up. And maybe you'll, you'll get into what you had prepared that you were going to talk about and convince them this is a great price value. They know they're comfortable with you and with the warranty on this product or when they're going to get it. And everything is just going right. And, and as you're talking, you're shaking your head like this and you're doing your hands like this. You're doing your hands up and down. Remember those gestures that we talked about are so important as you're making presentations? They are very important, especially when you're closing a deal. Because if, when you start shaking your head as you're talking real softly and maybe even using some quiet moments, you look over at them and you know what they're doing? They're shaking their head with you. That means they're in the aha moment. When you when their movements are agreeing with you with hand shaking and such as that and you're moving your hands up and down and when that head starts shaking, that's when you move in with your handshake and they're ready to shake your hand. You won't get resistance on that. You just say something simply, let's shake on this deal. Or right here's the number. I'm going to draw a circle around an initial. Just put your initial right there. And you just got the deal. And they never had to say, yes, I'll take it. It is amazing. It's amazing. It's it's not comedy. It's just it's just uh, so uh, gratifying to know that you learned a skill that can help someone get rid of their anxieties and close a business deal with you. Because when you see that buying sign, when you know they're releasing their anxieties long enough to breathe easy enough. You need to move in like a pro and close the deal and get them to buy the product. And that's how you do it. That's how you do it, and other people who don't know these little secrets don't do it. It's your technique, and yours may be a little different than mine, but I, I've been practicing mine for 60-some years. And you'll have your way, and I've seen other operators do it their way. But recognizing the aha moment, and at that moment you stop selling and start closing. Some people will just keep right on talking. They just love to talk, 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 and they want to hear their voice so good they forget about closing the sale. The customer forgets about his aha moment and brings back the anxieties, and you don't get the deal. <clears throat> it happens every day, thousands and thousands of times across the world, 
to folks that have not had this lesson. You'll see it happen, and you'll try it, and you'll see it work. And as you get skilled at it, it'll work real well. So I want to say to you, congratulations. I know you're going to be better salespeople. I know you're going to be a better business person. I indeed know that you are on a good path as being an entrepreneur because almost every one of you have been with me at least for five weeks, some of you all seven, and we got uh uh, five more weeks to go that you can keep on coming and catch up on any work that you hadn't done to get your certificates and such as that. Remember what I said, it's all about staying in the race. That's how we are successful as entrepreneurs. It's not making that billion dollars. It's not making the big, uh, biggest uh, building in town or building a skyscraper. skyscraper. Regular, dedicated, devoted entrepreneurs know the way we win the race is to stay in it, to get to the finish line. Because every day we're in the race, and we learn new things. If we're willing to learn new things like we all have during the past seven weeks, and we start putting them into play, we get better at it. And we'll make more money, and we'll know how to weather the rough times because they're going to come. They, they could be coming along. But we're going to stay in this race because we know how to do it for the long term. So thank you so much. You're going to win it by staying in it, and we got a few more weeks to go this summer, and then we'll start back in the fall because I want you to respect every person, maintain high standards, earn trust, foster partnerships, and I feel like all of y'all are my partners in one way or another, and embrace excellence. Be proud of all of us that, that, that go that extra mile and show us how we can do it as well. Congratulations. Be the best person you can be. Help others. Light your, your, your candle. Let it shine bright so to warm up the chilly air and bring people on in. So God bless you all. I want you to meet my Jesus one day. You can ride with him, and I want you to know whoever it is that brings you inspiration. Uh, it will make us all a better place to be and to do business. So thank you so much, and I'll say good night to you. And look forward to seeing you on our next occasion. I will be sending reminders to you. So let me turn the microphones back on, and we'll enjoy closing it out. Let's see here. Very good. All right. Thank you so much. Any conversations we'd like to have it? And we're going to have a little something special for Vanessa for sharing with us all that she shared with us. And we'll take that away in just a minute. Let's see if I can figure this out. Yep. <clears throat> Any conversation from anyone? No. Mm. I just want to say thank you. All right. Well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, I, I keep having all these different ideas of what I can do every time I attend the class. So I just I, want to say thank you. You might see a whole lot of DBAs on the Versatile NC. Oh, that sounds good. Those DBAs will make money for you. Uh, mm -hmm. let, let's, let's, give a, let's give Vanessa a little salute for her and her family's hard work in teaching us all how to start out a great marketing campaign. And she don't know we'll do this, so give me just a minute to get it started, and we'll do it. All right, Vanessa, this is just for you.
That is one fine tune. And Vanessa, thank you so much for letting me know that you like it because I've covered it as well. How about that? <laughs> I'm glad that you love it as much as I do. That was the very first song that Jeremy ever played for me on our very first date. How about that? That does have a special meaning to you and now to all of us because, you know, uh uh, I like to think about the people that I work with, my employees and my family, and all of you guys, because y'all are my family now, I see. And there is, we all are in this thing together, and we need to love and help each other. So uh, there's a lot, uh, that, that song's going to be my theme song for a little while, too. I love it. That's awesome. Thank you for all that you've taught me in this little seven weeks, and thank you for pushing me to be a better person. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Comments from anyone else? Love to hear from you. Christy, how about you? You've been I new like, to I'd like to say thank you, too, Steve, because you have um, made me thought about about in these seven weeks, and that's why I decided to call the business system and, and made an appointment, and I will want to see this to the end, and I want to say thank you so much. That would be great. Thank you so much, and keep hanging in there. Uh, Caesar and Ed, I hope I hope y'all are y'all still traveling, or did you settled down yet? We're out to get home, sir. We came from Golston, uh near Silent City. Uh huh. Renovated a house over there, and we're just about to get home. Well, there you go. Well, thank you for all that you've done, and we've got five more weeks, and I hope you'll stay with us uh, through thank the you second so much. part. Yeah, definitely. We'll All right. We're, we're definitely going to keep uh, coming back because uh, every day we learn something different, and it's good for business. Thank you so much, and God you bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tisha, thank you for hanging in there with us, and Edna, and uh, Kenny, I haven't got to talk to you yet. You got your, Can you talk now? <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> Okay, everybody, good night. Take care. God bless you, and we'll see you. Now, listen, if there's any way in the world that you can come over to the face-to-face uh, 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 webinar that we're not having in Keenansville, I really would love to meet you and hug your neck, and uh, we'll have some refreshments and have a good evening there uh, before we have to go back to online lessons. So take care and, and uh, be safe, okay? Good night, Steve. Good night. Good night. I bless you. Thank you so much.